Well, hello, community. Again, I'm so glad that you're with us today, and I just want to let you know that we are praying for you. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know what each one of you are going through, but please know that you're in our prayers. And if we can help, please let us know. And if we can help, we certainly will. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. When I heard Waymaker the very first time, I knew that that was quickly becoming a favorite of mine. And, and I asked Craig and our worship team to sing this for us today as we start this new teaching series called Waymaker. And there's some other lyrics in the song that just really deeply resonate with me that, that when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. And I, I have a feeling that some of us need to hear those words. That God is at work. He's, he's working, whether we see it, whether we realize it, whether we feel it or not. He is at work. He is our way maker God. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And these are encouraging words from that song. But here's some more encouraging words, even more encouraging words from Jesus. When, when his followers were uh, struggling, when they were troubled, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 1, he said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Did anyone have a troubled heart today? Uh, many of us. That's just the truth about what's going on. Jesus said, Trust in God. Trust also in me. He is our way maker. We trust in him. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And then a very familiar verse of scripture, Jesus answered, I am. I am the way. Jesus is the way. He is the way maker. He is our way maker God. And he changes us and he's transforming us in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this crisis. I mean, he, he transforms us from, well, from panic to prayer, from worry to worship. He transforms us from fear to faith. And he's doing a work inside of us. But the truth about Jesus is not only does he change what's going on inside of us, he changes us. He changes our entire direction and our entire life. I've been pretty upfront that when I was in high school, I, I was pretty far from God. I just was. I was kind of a prodigal during that season of my life. I've you know, kind of confessed that I was not voted most likely to become a pastor while I was in high school. I, I, I wasn't. I, I partied a lot and most of my friends did. And that was just the, ch the choices and decisions that I, I made during that time. And if you could kind of sum up my life, because I had a lot of questions, doubts, to be honest with you, and, and that you could sum up my life. I, 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 was, uh, I was a skeptic, but I, I moved from being a skeptic to becoming a believer. And I, I don't know what your story is. We all have a story. Your story's not finished yet if, if you're still breathing. And so what I'd like for you to do is engage with us during this service in the comment section, whether you're on our live stream page or Facebook Live or YouTube Live, then what you do is you just say what your story is. You can do it in four or five words. You can say transform from, for me it was skeptic, to believer. Or maybe you just say from something to something. Because God is at work. He's a way maker God. He's changing us and he's transforming us. And so I'd love to be able to read your comments later on in the day about your story, your story in four words or your story in five words. Many of us have been transformed by the power of Jesus and we celebrate the cross this week uh, on Good Friday about the greatest sacrifice that's ever been made for us. I don't know if it's still there or not, but there was a pretty impressive prison in Brazil in South America where the inmates were being dramatically transformed by the cross of Jesus. Chuck Colson reported that 25 years ago in the city of San Jose dos Campos, Brazil, the prison there was turned over to two Christian laymen who wanted to operate this prison just on Christian principles. And so every prisoner was assigned another inmate to whom they would be accountable. Every prisoner was required to attend chapel or to take a, a course on character development. Every prisoner was required to learn a trade so they could make restitution to their victim. And every prisoner was assigned a family on the outside uh, that would coach them when they got outside and encourage them while they were still inside before they were released. And after visiting the prison, Chuck Colson, he wrote these words, I found the inmates smiling, particularly the murderer who opened the gate and let me in. Wherever I walked, I saw 
I saw men at peace. I saw clean living areas. I saw people working industriously. I saw Bible verses on all of the walls that had been painted with the word of God. And here's an amazing statistic that Colson shared. He said, over the 25 years, only 4% of the former inmates had reoffended and returned. And then he, he quoted the uh, statistics for recidivism in the United States. He said, our national recidivism rate in the U.S. runs about 50% within three years and about 90% within 20 years. Now, how is this possible? Colson wrote, I saw the answer when my inmate guide escor escorted me to the notorious punishment cell that was once used for torture. Today, he told me that block houses only a single inmate as we reached the end of the long concrete corridor, as my inmate guide, as he stuck that key into the cell block, he asked me one more time, are you sure you want to go in? And Colson said, of course I want to go in. I've been in isolation cells all over the world. Slowly he swung open the massive door and I saw the prisoner in that punishment cell, a crucifix beautifully carved by the inmates the prisoner, Jesus, hanging on the cross. And my guide said softly, he's doing time for all the rest of us. Friends, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. And the cross has awesome power. The cross has amazing power, not only to forgive our sins, but to transform us as well. And, and the, the cross can, is where our addictions can be overcome. The cross is where relationships can be healed. The cross is where strained, uh, dangerous temptations can be resisted through the power of the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, those who become Christians, they become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone and a new life has begun. And that doesn't mean that we're perfect, far from it, no perfect people at community, but we are different, we are changed, we are better people because of, we as like to say at community, we're a place to believe and belong and become, and we're in the process of becoming greater, better, different, transformed than we are right now through the power of the cross. And what I want to do at today, just real quickly, is I want to look at the cross from the perspective of some bystanders whose lives were completely transformed. I mean, they had no idea when they got up that morning that it was a good Friday, that when this parade, this execution march, as Jesus was carrying his cross through Jerusalem, the Via Della Rosa, they had no idea that their life would be dramatically changed as a result of what was taking place. They had no idea that that was going to happen, that their lives would never be the same. And, and friends, that same transforming power of Jesus, maybe that's going to be your story, that you had no idea that today as you're just listening in on a message and maybe a friend invited you to a watch party or something and you're hearing about the transformational power of the cross and maybe this is the beginning of your transformational experience uh, with Jesus. Now, one of those unexpected bystanders was a man named Simon. Simon was a man who was transformed from a casual observer to an active follower of Jesus. You know, Simon was from the city of Cyrene, which was in Libya, North Africa. And evidently, there was a pretty sizable Jewish population in Cyrene. And, and so Simon had traveled all the way to Jerusalem to participate in the Passover feast that was taking place. Maybe he had saved up for this event for years. Maybe it was on his bucket list. Maybe he said that, I, I want to go to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover feast in the holy city of Jerusalem just one time before I die. It was a big journey and Simon, Simon was there. And look at what Mark 15, 21, and, and notice how Simon was transformed. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. So there's this maddening parade, maybe like Mardi Gras or New York Times Square, I don't know. And people were pressed in and they're just watching what's happening. And Simon just happened to come out probably. He didn't know. He, he, just, he was there and then there's Jesus who was carrying the cross beam and Jesus had been whipped, scourged, flogged mercilessly, massive blood loss, complete exhaustion. And evidently Jesus just collapsed on the street right there, probably right in front of Simon. And the Roman soldiers in that day, they, they had the authority, they could conscript anyone into temporary service. And they said, you, you, 
pick up that cross. You carry the cross. And I'm sure Simon goes, what? <laughs> not, not me. I mean, the guy behind me? No, you, pal. You, you pick up that cross and you carry the cross. And he didn't want to have anything to do with that. What a humiliating experience. What a gruesome experience. Picking up this cross beam that was dripping with the blood of Jesus who had just been scourged and wearing a crown of thorns and and Simon didn't want to have anything to do with that. There's a song in an Easter pageant that the person who plays the part of Simon sings these words. So I knelt and took the cross from the Lord, placed it on my shoulders and started down the street. The blood that he was shedding was now running down my cheeks. And the close encounter with Jesus transformed Simon for forever. I mean, he saw his expression. He felt Jesus' blood on, on his body and maybe you heard Jesus whisper a thank you when they got to Golgotha, the place of the skull where Jesus would be crucified. And he witnessed how Jesus died. And Simon was transformed forever, evidently. Because when Mark writes about him, he says this in Mark 15, 21, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And so, now if I was to say to you, this man is the father of Brian Jones, that wouldn't mean much to any of you, I mean, I know Brian Jones, but you don't. But if I was to say, this man is the father of Brian Beckner. Uh, for many of you, for most of you, you know who that is. Brian is, is our executive pastor. He's been at community. I've been at community for 26 years. He's been longer than me, maybe 28. I'm not sure how long. But there's a, a context. There's a, a frame of reference for the father of Brian Jones, because, I mean, of Brian uh, Beckner, because you, you know him. Now, when Mark wrote, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, evidently everybody in the church knew he was talking about. In, in another book, in, in Romans chapter 16, it, it reads this. Paul wrote these words. He said, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. So it seems very likely that this humiliating experience that Simon had resulted in Simon's conversion and also in the conversion of his family. Simon came to Jerusalem to sacrifice his Passover lamb. And he met the lamb of God who was sacrificed for him. You know, some people are kind of drafted into service, kind of like Simon. I mean, they don't have much of a choice. Bob Russell uh, has been a mentor of mine for many years. Bob was the lead pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. That church grew to about 18,000 people when Bob was there. He was my preaching professor when I was in the master's program at Kentucky Christian University. And Bob's just such a great and humble guy. And, and he told this story. I've told this one before. It's one of my favorite Bob Russell stories. It was, it was a time when... Uh, he was doing a baptism. And there's a guy in their church by the name of Bill Weedman. And Bill Weedman was a volunteer. He worked in the kids' church program, children's church, like we have here at Community. But during the week, his day job, Bill Weedman was a police officer. He was on the SWAT team. He was a black belt in karate. You're seeing the picture there. Bob loved to say that they had very few discipline problems in their children's church as a result of Bill Weedman being there. But they, the kids loved Bill Weedman. And oftentimes when they would make the decision to be baptized, they would ask Bill Weedman to do the baptism. So Bob was talking about one time, they, uh, they were in the baptismal changing area and Bob was baptizing an adult and that, that adult man was, was there in that room. And then Bill Weedman walked in to baptize a child and he, he took off his coat and he's a plain clothesman and it revealed his holster and his gun that was there. And that, that adult didn't know Bill Weedman from Adam and he just looked at that, his eyes got real big and Bill Weedman kind of read the situation and he just said, hey, we've got a no back out policy about baptisms around here. So it was a, it was a great story. I've, thought about how we might be able to implement something like that here at community. But, but here's the, the point um, about that, is that some people don't have much of a choice in the matter. Those inmates in the prison in Brazil, they had to have an accountability partner. They had to attend chapel. They didn't have much of a choice. And maybe you really didn't have much of a choice to take up your cross and follow Jesus because your parents, I mean, they took you to church from the earliest age and your parents made you go and since you were little. Pastor Tony Evans said that when he was a teenager, he had a drug problem. He was drugged to church on Sunday morning. He was drugged to church on Sunday night. Maybe you can you have a similar experience, similar drug problem, that your parents drug you to church. And you were, you were forced, kind of, to follow Jesus at an early age. And, and like Simon, you felt like you were just kind of drafted into the Lord's service. But maybe you'll be like Simon, who took up that cross because he was forced to. But then when he had a choice, 
he never put it down again. And so Simon was uh, transformed from this just observer to this follower. Again, what's your faith story in four words or five words? How have you been transformed? Put that in the comments. I'd love to see that later. Maybe even that's been percolating with you for a little bit of time. Now, the, another bystander at the cross was transformed. Was that was the Roman centurion. Here's a man who was transformed from a hostile skeptic to a humble believer. Now, this centurion, he was... He was the commander of the Roman execution squad. I mean, it was their job to kill people, to execute people by crucifixion. That was his role, that was his job, and he oversaw everyone who would do that. Mark chapter 15, verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely, surely this man was the son of God. Now, the Gospels tell us how the Roman soldiers just absolutely brutalized Jesus. I mean, they punched him in the face. They spit on him. They put a crown of thorns on him. They flogged him. They they shredded his back. If you you watch the movie, The Passion of the Christ, that that was hard to watch, to see the level of suffering and pain that Jesus went through on our behalf. And this, this commander... I mean, he oversaw that, and he just allowed his men to kind of play sport uh, with this Jewish revolutionary. It's just horseplay. It was just another day at the office for this commander. But he started watching Jesus, how he was responding throughout all this experience. It It was completely unusual. Here was a man of composure. Here was a man of dignity, even in the midst of incredible pain and suffering. And This commander, he heard Pilate say in Luke 23, 4, I find nothing wrong with this man. He would heard people being executed all the time because crucifixion was very common in that day. Resurrection, not so common. I mean, that's the thing that sets Jesus apart from every other Jewish man that was crucified. Jesus conquered death, and we're going to celebrate that in a week from today. That's not in my notes, but I, I couldn't let that go. So anyway, crucifixion was common and, and so he was used to hearing those who were being crucified, just string of profanity and just use incredibly foul language, but he'd never heard someone actually pray for forgiveness for his executioners as Jesus did. In Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He'd never witnessed the sky getting black in the middle of the day when Jesus was crucified, and it was eerie. He never felt the earth tremble and shake, and his soul started to tremble, I'm guessing, as well. And when he looked at Jesus dying, he could never remember hearing a man say with such conviction as Jesus said. He called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he never heard when someone in their last breath, they, they cried out, not in defeat, but in triumph and victory. They never heard anybody say these words, it is finished. And what was finished? Well, Jesus' mission, Jesus came to save the world. He came to be the savior. When he was born, it was told that you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And salvation was now available to all people for all time. It was finished because Jesus died in our place as our substitute and it was finished. And the manner in which he suffered and, and the manner in which he responded to that, it just transformed this Roman commander. Mark 15, 39. And when the centurion, he stood there in front of Jesus, heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. You know, the cross has transformed a, a lot of people from hostile skeptics to, well, humble believers. Saul persecuted the church It was mission one to eradicate this evil. Jesus was an imposter and it was was a threat to Judaism and Saul was just rounding up and persecuting and being a part of killing Christians. It was on his road to the city of Damascus where he had this encounter with the resurrected Christ and, and, and Jesus changed him. And Paul went from becoming this enemy of the faith to the the greatest advocate, to this missionary that God used in such a dramatic way to to change the world. And God used him. And Paul said these words in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. As for me, God forbid that I should boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world died long ago. Now, over the years, many skeptics have become believers, such as C.S. Lewis, brilliant author and professor, and I've seen quite a few quotes about C.S. Lewis that that have been online in the midst of this pandemic. 
brilliant thinker. C.S. Lewis did not want to become a follower of Jesus. He was an agnostic, and he, he said that he came kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. It wasn't what he had hoped for, but it's where the truth took him, and he became a follower as he moved from being a skeptic. Lee Strobel was a devout atheist and investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune, uh, Yale-educated, brilliant, and the worst thing in the world happened to Lee one day was when his wife started going to church and, and her worldview started to change and she started to, she started to change and she started to make some changes in the way she was interacting with him. And, but still, he was so unsettled. I mean, this was not what he bargained for. And, and so he started attending that same church, sat on the back row for about a year and a half, took all kinds of notes, investigated this, attempting to disprove Christianity. And at the end of a year and a half journey, he came to faith and he was transformed from a very hostile skeptic to a humble believer. And his life story is actually out on movie, The Case for Christ, and you can see Lee Strobel's story. And if you're a skeptic, I'm so glad that you're watching today. I mean, that was certainly, it was me. And, and that's why I love to say that community is not just a place for those who are already convinced. If you have doubts, if you have questions, that you're, you're welcome in our faith community. But here's the thing, I, I don't want you just to, to doubt your faith or doubt the faith, but how about doubt your doubts? And what I mean by that is, is sometimes we might have some questions, but we never really go on a diligent quest to find out if there are answers to those questions. And so that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Maybe you have some extra time in the midst of this pandemic, and rather than just cleaning the garage for the fourth or the fifth time, is that you say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go on this faith journey. I'm going I'm to either rule this out or rule this in, you know, for once and for all. I'm going to move this from the back burner to the, to the front burner. And how do you do that? Well, you can, you can go to our website, communitycc.com, scroll all the way down to Right Now Media. It's a button, orange button, and just click on that. We'll give you a subscription to what's basically a Christian Netflix. And, and there are over 20,000 videos, and there are 85 videos. If you put in the search bar, apologetics, apologetics, 85 videos will come up, which will give some of the brightest minds of our time that will try to answer some of the most common questions that people have about faith. And, and I just wanna, I wanna challenge you. I don't wanna encourage you. I'm gonna challenge you if you're a skeptic to do this, that you do that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the, the new has come. And, and I, I pray that the new will come for you. Now, I want to look lastly at two other bystanders at the cross, Joseph and Nicodemus. They were transformed from secret disciples to bold witnesses. Now, both of these guys, Joseph and Nicodemus, they were members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the, uh, the highest court in the land, about 70 men. And they were respected. They were influential. They were, they were well off. They, they were the influential leaders of that day. John 19, verse 38 reads, Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, there we go, so because he feared the Jewish leaders, he asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body down. When Pilate gave him permission, he came and he took the body away. So there's Joseph. In the next verse, in verse 39, Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, also came, bringing about 75 pounds of embalming ointment made from myrrh and from aloes. Both of, both of them were impressed with Jesus. Both of them were kind of leaning in a little bit, but frankly, you know, from a distance because, well, the other members of the Sanhedrin, they had this really condescending attitude toward Jesus initially. I mean, he wasn't from their schools. He wasn't from Jerusalem or Judea. He was from way up north in Galilee and no prophet came from that area. And then it, it moved from just frustration and irritation to, well, then Jesus became a threat to them because their influence was waning. The people started following Jesus because there was nobody like him. And so Joseph and Nicodemus, their relationship with Jesus was kind of kept at bay. In the shadows, they were watching a little bit from, from a distance. They're kind of like that little boy who had a, had a mutt, a dog that was just this half breed, this kind of mangy looking dog. And somebody asked him, said, what kind of dog is that, son? And he said, it's a police dog. He said, that doesn't look like any police dog. He goes, well, he's undercover. <laughs> I, I like that story. And some of the followers of Jesus then and some followers of Jesus today are, are still undercover and secretly follow after Jesus. John chapter three relates that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. This is Nicodemus at night, which is really the first episode of Nick at night. Okay, it's not, I, I made that up, but maybe you'll remember now. Nick at night, John three. And probably because Nicodemus didn't want to risk being seen by the other members of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees during the daytime. 
But John 7, 51 relates to the Sanhedrin. This court, they met to plot against Jesus and Nicodemus timidly spoke up. In John 7, 51, it says, is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? Now, that's just kind of straddling the fence. He's just asking the question. It's not like he's saying, I believe in this man. He is, he's the Messiah. We, we need to follow him. No, he's not saying that at all. He just kind of timidly says, well, let's look at both sides. Listen to the response, the next verse, verse 52. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures and see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. Okay, okay, okay. I get it, guys. Just raising a question. I'm with you. I'm still one of you. I mean, he's kind of probably backpedaling at that point. He straddled the fence and Truth be told, sometimes when you straddle a fence, it, it becomes painful. Most of us know what it is to feel guilty about pulling back. We know what it is like to feel guilty for not standing up when there's an opportunity to stand up for Jesus. And, and I think Joseph and I think Nicodemus, I think they felt guilty when they saw Jesus hanging on the cross, when they saw the level of, of torture and suffering that Jesus experienced and and when they saw Jesus die, it just, it, just, it just created this boldness inside of them. And they realized that they had waited way too long. They'd been undercover and it was, it was time to make their faith visible and to clarify their allegiance. And it was time for them to, to save their souls and, and not their skins. Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. He went boldly, there's that word, he went boldly now to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph bought a long sheet of linen and taking Jesus' body down from the cross, he wrapped it in the cloth and he laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. Now, friends, I gotta tell you, this was an incredibly risky thing for them to do. I mean, it was gonna be clear. <laughs> I mean, they, they would know who took the body off the cross. I mean, that would, that would travel quickly through the, all of Jerusalem. They would know where the body was laid. They would know that it was in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. They would, they would know because Roman soldiers were commanded to be present at the tomb to protect and prevent anyone from stealing the body. So everyone would know. Can you not hear the members of the Sanhedrin whispering or maybe not even whispering, say, I can't believe this. I can't believe Joseph. I mean, I've known Joseph since our, our kids have grown up together. We've been friends forever and he's sold out. He's a secret disciple. What, what about Nicodemus? I've been friends with him. I can't believe him. He's a traitor too. And that's probably the talk that was happening. But the cross transformed them. Transformed them from secret disciples into bold witnesses. And when you encounter the cross, it will transform you as well. 2 Corinthians 3.12 says, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. And when you see the courage of Jesus dying publicly, unashamedly, it motivates you to have a new boldness. Peter, Peter and John were told by the officials in Jerusalem not to speak about Jesus. This is after the resurrection now. Not to speak about Jesus anymore. But they said in Acts 4.20, I love this verse, for we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. And they went out into the streets and boldly spoke about Jesus. Again, in the Bible, it says in Acts 4.13, that when these religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were threatened by Jesus, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great description? That, that they had been with Jesus and the closer that you get to Jesus, the more you will be bold in your witness for him. The Apostle Paul wrote these words in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And your bold witness today may be an online witness. Maybe this week where you haven't really gone public with your faith before and your friends may not know of, of the belief that you have, you, you share a scripture verse. Maybe you've just become really real and you say, look, I, I'm, I'm struggling with anxiety and, and fear, but my faith in Jesus is helping me to, to have a greater level of confidence and to go from fear to faith. And, and maybe you share that part of your story online and, and you help lead someone that might not yet be a follower of Jesus. And maybe on Easter, <laughs> You, you host a watch party and, and you invite people to be a part of you and you talk with them in the middle of the service while they're watching our Easter service. I don't know if you've thought about this, but I've been on so many different Zoom calls with pastors around the country, I mean, Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. And, and, but this is the truth. I really believe this to be true. I believe that more people are gonna hear the hope of Jesus this Easter on our planet than have ever heard in the history of the world. Why? Because we're quarantined, we're, we can't get out. And, and those who may not normally go to a church, I mean, 
There's just gonna be opportunity all day long and people are gonna be searching. And you can host a party, a watch party, and, and you can be bold in your faith in that way. Maybe your boldness and your witness is just to demonstrate a, a Christian life to your family if they're not supporting you in, in the faith direction that you have. First Peter chapter three, verse 15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have. And Peter adds this last phrase, but do this with gentleness and respect. So we can be bold and also gentle and respectful in how we engage other people because friends, this is an unprecedented time and maybe an unprecedented receptivity in the lives and the hearts of other people. Let's not miss it. Let's not miss this moment that God can use to bring people, to call people home to him because all people matter to him. It was 1967 when Charles Murray was attending school at the University of Cincinnati and he was training for the Summer Olympics in 1968 as a high diver and he met another student who boldly shared his faith about how he had come to faith and how he had been saved and he was sharing this with Charles and Charles didn't grow up in the church and he was really intrigued he was and fascinated with hearing about this Jesus and how Jesus had died on the cross for the sins of all people. Well, one day the student asked Charles if he realized that, that he needed a savior. And Charles said, no. And he pushed back and he started to avoid this student. Several weeks passed and he was really struggling with this whole idea of, of needing forgiveness of sins, of needing the hope of heaven. And, and so he called that student on the phone and he asked him where he could look in the Bible to find some verses on salvation. And the student told him where to find some passages that might be helpful that way. And he asked, said, Charles, could could we get together? Could I, I talk with you? Because it seemed like you're really troubled. And Charles pushed away again. No, 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 I'm, I'm good. Because Charles was training for the Olympic Games. He had special privileges at the university pool facilities. And sometime between 1030 and 11, 11 o'clock p.m. later that day after that conversation, he decided to go, go for a swim and practice a few dives from the high dive. It was a clear night in October of 1967. The moon was big, the moon was bright, and the university pool was, was housed under a ceiling of glass panes and that would just let the, the moonlight just kind of shine in uh, to that pool area. So as uh, Charles came in there, it was just kind of lit up in a beautiful way, and so he didn't even turn the lights on. And he climbed up to the highest platform level to do his, his dive. And, uh, and he stood on the platform, and he, he stood you know, backwards and the pool was behind him. And as divers often do, as we watch when we see those guys, he, he put out his arms to the side to kind of stabilize him a little bit. And then he was looking down, you know, making sure right before he would dive. And when he looked up, the moon was behind him and it was casting a shadow on the back wall. And he saw his shadow and the image of a cross and everything that he had been struggling with and, and troubled with over the last few weeks, it just all just kind of welled up inside of him. And he just, he just, his heart just broke and he just kind of fell and, you know, right at the top of that platform. And he just started to ask God to, to forgive his sins. And it was a pretty powerful moment. And it was right during that time that a pool attendant came in and flipped on the lights. And it was when Charles, when he looked down from the top of that highest platform in that pool, he saw that the pool had uh, been drained of the water for repairs. And Charles Murray, he, he realized that, well, he had been spared death or just a tragic injury by the power of the cross. And friend, the power of the cross can save you too. Jesus died so that you could have the hope of heaven one day. He died so that you could live forever with him. And it's my prayer that, that you will decide to do that. And maybe even today. I don't know if it's still there. But on I-10, which starts in Jacksonville, and, it, and it, it goes all the way out west. It goes through Lake City and Tallahassee and the Panhandle. And then when, it, when it's going through Louisiana, as, it, as it's going across the Mississippi River, there used to be this large billboard that was there that had this, this image of, of Jesus hanging on the cross with Jesus' head bowed. And then captioned underneath were these large words that says, it's your move. It's your move. Friend, God has taken the initiative to give us the hope of heaven. He's calling you. He's inviting you to that. It's your move. It's your move.
I want to ask you, uh, right where you're at, maybe you're just watching on a phone, maybe you're on a computer, maybe you're in your home and there's family around, but wherever you're at, if you would just bow your head right now, I want to ask if you'll do that. And, and I, I, just want to, I just want to pray for you, and if you would just do that for a moment. Maybe you've been a casual observer, you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He, he wants to forgive your sin. He wants to give you a fresh start. He wants to give you a clean slate. He wants to give you a new beginning. Jesus said, it is finished. And what he finished on the cross was for you. He's for you. He's not against you. He wants you to spend forever with him in heaven one day. And you could make the greatest decision that you could ever make to make Jesus the Savior, the Lord of your life, and just go from an observer to become a follower of Jesus. And that's the greatest decision you could ever make. Maybe you've been skeptical about the truth claims of Jesus Christ, but you've never really done anything about your skepticism. I mean, you've never really tried to find out if there are answers to your questions. So again, I wanna encourage you to doubt your doubts and go on a faith quest, a, a journey. And that's, that's what I pray for you that, that you will begin. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus, but kind of a secret service undercover follower of Jesus. And it's time. These are serious times. And it's time for you to become bold. And, and I'm praying that you will pray that God will give you that boldness that you want and you'll begin to declare your faith with gentleness and also with respect. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I, I, I thank you for the power of the cross, the wonderful cross. It, it changes us. It transforms us. It's available for all. So Father, I, I pray for those who are considering making decisions right now. I, I pray that your spirit would just prompt and move mightily in their hearts and in their lives. God, I, I pray that you would direct them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.